Sarah, do you have the PowerPoint? Perfect. Can everybody see it? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, okay great. So it is seven o'clock. So shall we get started, everybody? Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome. It is so nice to have you here. here. Thank you for joining us for our Center for Health Disparity Innovation and Studies Trusted Messenger Flu Training. Um, you know what? Now that I see this here, I believe. I'm working a little ahead, people. I apologize about that. I'm just so excited to get to the breakout sessions that I was just getting a little far ahead of myself. And so Dr. Miriam, perfect. Great, do you wanna share that one? So again, um, welcome everybody. We are all here and we're very grateful you're here um, as our trusted messengers to share this very important message about the flu with everybody um, and the community. And we are excited to learn together um, and then hear about your plans um, and how you are going to share this information with everybody. Um, and so, uh, perfect. If Everybody is muted right now. We will ask you to unmute when we go to the breakout sessions. And if you haven't had a chance to tell us where you're from, please do so in the chat box because we wanna make sure we recognize everybody that's here. And we also wanna thank the CDC for providing us the funding for being able to do this. Um, all of our partners and our sponsors, we are so thankful for you. This is a little brief rundown of what we are going to be doing, our training agenda. Um, I hope everybody had some time to complete the pretest. If you didn't, there's gonna be just a few minutes before we get started here. And so go ahead and feel free to fill that out. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Wu will get us started with a warm introduction and welcome. And then you will be hearing from several of our Eastern Michigan faculty in their areas of expertise. Dr. Jenny Hoffman, we are so lucky to have her with us, um, our community health leader and instructor. She's going to tell us all about the flu. Dr. Alice Jo Rainville, who works in our nutrition domain with the CHDIS. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about just some you know, stress relief and ways to keep your immune system happy. And then our wonderful Europe students that work with Dr. Wu are gonna help us with our breakout session. We'll have a short Q and A and we'll wrap up from there and we will send our post tests out after everything is done. And so I believe I would love to turn it over to Dr. Wu. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And um, the fact you're here, uh, each one of you is my hero because that, you know, you have a long day already and then still here, you know, during the dinner time. Thank you all and thank you for your availability and thank you for your dedication. Um, so um, I um, hate to say that word one more time. This year is unprecedented, you know, and we got um, kind of 
I feel like I'm being affect, you know, attacked, you know, by this uh, um, unknown virus things that now we heard every single day so many times. But you know, despite of this, that there, um, we, we we still want to find the ways that um, for communities working together, and um, so this is um, the flu vaccinations projects that we feel it's so important that while we are all waiting for um, COVID um, vaccines, and we really want to empower our communities so they could get the best, the maximum protections, you know, because we don't want them you know to worry and you know being kind of um infected by another you know things that could give them you know absolutely uh full protections and so that's why in um this year earlier this year is that uh, we receive a cdc supplemental funding to our reach some of you are um our reach partners and have worked with us and so we want to continue to collaborate with you in a full effort uh in this flu vaccination projects. So um, so this would be a year, uh, one year project starting in September 30th uh, to next uh, next year, 2021, September 29th. And, but, you know, with the, the flu things that you know that in the next few months will be the most critical moments and uh, times that we could put the work forward. And so in this uh, flu vaccination projects that there are two um, most important outcomes, which is that, you know, we want to uh, deliver and disseminate the uh, flu vaccination to our communities in the culturally appropriate language appropriate way. And of course that our team cannot do it alone. We need your help. You know, you're all the navigators working so dedicately in, in, your, in your community. So we want to work with you, but we also want to empower you to become our trusted messenger to deliver the uh, important message, dispel the myths and uh, misconceptions. And so that's a first, you know, front, you know, and kind of outcomes that we want to achieve. And then, you know, um, is it, you know, ones that uh, the, the communities that receive the uh, education from all of you in a variety of way, then is that we need to make sure they take the actions. So um, um, our team, uh, especially Sarah, Miriam, will be kind of uh, uh, working with you and your organization to set up mobile clinics. And we also make sure that, you know, um, we when, when this becomes available, which is that public health department have their uh, vac vaccine ready, and then we can send out a list of resources where the community resident could get um, the vaccines, you know, um, in the in in the ways that they are most effective. So that's the two modes that you know we want your help and we want to collaborate with you. So today's that like Sarah say that we have this best, you know, um, information coming from the next community health expert, Professor Jenny Hoffman. And um, then, you know, also the our faculty um, from uh, our team, REACH team, uh, Dr. Professor Alice Jo Renville and uh, Sarah is also our nurse educator that some of you work in the lead health project. So they were going to, uh, together, they're going to bring out a very comprehensive information education on the, the, the topic. So, you know, you will get all the in-depth information. And then we hope that you could take this information uh, in our breakout room uh, sessions because we will give you a different scenario. We hope you can kind of uh, um, act as a messenger and react to uh, respond to these individual scenarios. And then, you know, after that, we want to hear your plan because that um, we want to work with you, you know, in these two um, outcomes, you know, how could we work together to promote the food uh, message in the community in the community you represent and how could we help you know the community 
residents to take actions. So um, after the breakout room, we want you to come back and share with us, you know, what's your plan look like? And that's about, you know, um, um, this uh, tonight's training program agenda. And um, again, I'm very fortunate to work at wonderful teams. And I will also want to acknowledge our uh, staff uh, team members, uh, Jessica Donnelly, if you can just wave. And uh, is Rachel still here? Okay, so uh, she's kind of blind out, but oh, hi, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel is our REACH um, nutrition. Some of you have you already worked with her, uh, Rachel, for the last two years. Yeah, thank you for being uh, here with us. And um, I will turn the um, kind of uh, focus to Professor Jenny Hoffman. Jenny? You're going to use your own PowerPoint, Jenny? Oh, you're muted. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Wu, for asking me. I'm Associate Professor of Nursing at Eastern Michigan University, and I'm also a family nurse practitioner at uh, the Washtenaw County Health Department. Excited to get started. Can everyone see my slides? Okay. Good. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to be covering some basics regarding influenza or the flu. It's helpful to start out with the definition. So influenza or the flu is considered a contagious respiratory illness caused by influenza viruses. And there are two main types, influenza A, um, which is responsible for causing the more severe influenza infections and influenza B, which is responsible for causing some of the milder influenza infections. A lot of times when people hear someone say that they have the flu, they think stomach intestinal virus that causes nausea, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but really influenza or flu, while it can cause those symptoms and it's more common in kids when it does, it's actually a respiratory virus. It's most common in fall and winter. Technically, it can take place anytime during the year, but we see it seasonally, usually fall and winter. Flu season is considered to be October to March, and it really peaks in activity December to February. So that's when we really see the majority of cases. It's primarily spread by droplets when someone with influenza sneezes, coughs, or talks. And it can also be spread when someone touches a surface or object and then that influenza virus is on there. And then when someone else comes along and touches it and then they touch their own eyes, nose or mouth, then they can be exposed to influenza that way. This is why it's really important to cough or sneeze in one's arm because that helps to really cut back on that transmission through inanimate objects like surfaces and things like that. When you think about if someone were to sneeze or cough into their hand and then touch a doorknob, then someone else comes along and touches that same doorknob and then gets influenza on their hands. That's why it's especially important to cough or sneeze in one's elbow because that really helps to kind of break that chain in terms of transmission. So signs and symptoms of the flu, they usually come on suddenly and often include a fever, a feeling of just not being well, Muscle aches, and these are usually diffuse, so all over the body. A cough, and it's usually non-productive, meaning usually not bringing up mucus. And it can be a runny or stuffy nose, um, but it's more common for it to be nasal congestion or stuffiness. And then it commonly the incubation period, and incubation means from the time that one is exposed to the time they start to come down with symptoms, usually that's about one to three days. And then one is contagious from about three to five days from the time it starts 
and producing symptoms. The most infectious period is that first 24 hours before the onset of symptoms and then during the period of peak symptoms when one feels the worst. Most symptoms last about three to four days, but cough and just that general feeling of not feeling well, that can persist one to two weeks. So influenza is diagnosed with a rapid test in the office. It can actually differentiate if one has A or B. Uh, oftentimes it's a nasal swab. We get the results back in about 10 minutes. There is also a test that can test for influenza and COVID at the same time. Um, that's available through local and state public health labs. Now with influenza testing, there can be false negatives where someone has a a uh, false test, but it, it's really positive. So it may come up negative when really the person has it, but that's not that common. These tests are pretty accurate. So in terms of treatment, the treatment is antiviral because we know that influenza is a virus. So um, the treatment is antiviral. There are about four FDA approved antiviral meds to treat influenza. We usually use acetamivir or Tamiflu, and that's because it's available as a generic um, while the others are uh, trade. So a lot of times patients will request an antibiotic, but that's not going to be effective against influenza because influenza is caused by a virus, and antibiotics are effective against bacterial infections. Now with antiviral treatment for influenza, it needs to be within 48 hours or two days of one being ill for the treatment to be effective. So really timing, if one thinks they have the flu, they should really go in and get tested as soon as possible because for treatment to be effective, it needs to be administered within that first 48 hours or two days. And the way that the treatment works is that it reduces the severity of symptoms and reduces the duration of infection in terms of how, how long the illness lasts. And then other medications that one can take include over-the-counter medication, um, analgesic, um, antipyretic, or, or medication that is good for decreasing aches, pains, discomforts, and fever. So this could be acetaminophen or Tylenol or ibuprofen or Motrin. Um, and then also cough medicine if one has uh, a cough with this. Now, in terms of cough, um, a lot of times with flu, it's a non-productive cough. So a uh, cough suppressant may work really well. If it's a productive cough where one is actually bringing up mucus when they cough, um, a medication like Mucinex over the counter can be really helpful for that because it helps to break up that phlegm and make it easier to cough up and get out. Uh, one thing to be careful of, over the counter, there are these cough cold medications um, flu and cold combinations. Something to keep in mind is that, you know, you want to be aware of what medications are in those combination products uh, because you don't want to say, take a combination product and then take more uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen on top of that because then you may get too much. Um, so always being cognizant of that. And then making sure to get plenty of fluids and rest. That is very important as well. So lots of water and make sure you get plenty of rest. In terms of prevention, hand hygiene is extremely important. So making sure to wash hands with soap and warm water for at least 20 seconds. So usually how long it takes to sing happy birthday or ABCs. And hand sanitizer is good when, when you don't have access to soap and water. Soap and water is the best. Um, because the way that that works is it helps to slough off viral particles off the hands, whereas hand sanitizer will inactivate or kill it on the hands, but it's still there. Um, so hand washing is the best, but hand sanitizer is good when that is not available. And next would be influenza flu vaccine, also extremely important in terms of preventing influenza. The flu vaccine is generally recommended for everyone six months of age and older and that's annually, so every year. And this is important because the flu A and B types that tend to be circulating, they can change up a little bit from year to year. So it's important that one gets a flu shot 
every year. Now, I do have on here with rare exception. And what that means is that there are some people who the flu vaccine is not recommended for, um, but that's very rare. And those may include someone that has a severe allergy to or, or reaction to uh, a previous influenza vaccine and severe reaction, meaning maybe they had trouble breathing, what's known as anaphylaxis, where they, they can't breathe. Um, that would be an example of a severe reaction or someone who um, has had a history of Guillain-Barre, which is um, a very rare condition where the body's immune system attacks the nerves. And it starts out as like weakness tingling from the lower extremities and kind of works its way up. And it can cause um, temporary paralysis. And the issue with that is that it can ultimately interfere with one's breathing. And so prompt uh, medical attention is very important. But Guillain-Barre is a very rare condition. And um, it can actually come about after a respiratory or GI virus or after vaccination. But again, um, that's very rare. And usually influenza or flu vaccination is recommended for everyone six months of age and older every year. The best time to get the flu vaccine is by the end of October. And the reason for that is because when we think about um, the seasonal flu, the season is usually considered October to March. So October, it's starting to you know, ramp up and then March, it's starting to subside. So best time to get the flu vaccine is by the end of October. The other thing to think about is that it takes about two weeks for it to be fully incorporated and for the body to develop protection against the flu. And so that also is taken into consideration in terms of timing. So best time is to get it by the end of October. And another thing that's important to note is it's best to get it in the arm that you're going to be using the most. So let's say you're right-handed, it's best to get it in the right arm. And the reason for that is because you're more apt to be moving that around. It's going to help get that medication, um, you know, that, that flu vaccine incorporated into the body faster. Um, now it can make the arm sore for a day or two, but again, just really moving that arm around will help it get incorporated faster and make it not be as uncomfortable. Okay, there are different types of flu vaccines. There's intranasal or nasal spray. And this is indicated for individuals that are two to 49 years of age. It's not indicated for pregnant individuals or those who are immune compromised. With the intranasal or the nasal spray, this is a weakened form of influenza weakened. So it can, many times does not, but it can cause mild symptoms of influenza. There is also the um, influenza vaccine that's often given into the muscle in the arm. And this is what's called a, um, ki a killed form of the virus or uh, inactivated. And that means it cannot make you sick. So sometimes people will say, well, I got my flu shot and then I got sick. So the flu shot gave me the flu. What likely happened is that the person may have been exposed several days before they got their flu shot. So it could have been incubating in them at the time they got their flu shot. Um, or it could be a completely different virus. So um, while the Intranasal or nasal spray contains a weakened form and can give one mild symptoms of influenza. The inactivated or killed form, which is in the flu shot, that cannot make you sick. That cannot give you the flu. So the flu shot um, is indicated for people six months of age and older. Um, again, with rare exception, there are some that, that we do not advise it for. Someone that had a severe um, reaction to a previous vaccine or if they had a history of Guillain-Barre, but that is very uncommon. So really indicated for um, most people, six months of age and older. And there are different forms that are available. So um, we have a high dose form for adults 65 years of age and older. They just need a little bit extra help 
to, um, to make this optimal with their immune system. So they, receive, they require a little bit higher of a dose. And then we also have egg-free um, vaccine product, and that's indicated for people that have egg allergies. So even if one has an allergy to egg, doesn't mean they can't get the flu shot, they just need a specific formulation. Okay. And this is also important to note. It's often asked, well, can I get the flu shot if I'm, you know, currently ill, you know, just a little bit under the weather. If one has mild illness, let's say mild cold or, you know, a little bit of a scratchy throat, uh, maybe, you know, just not feeling great. Technically, mild illness, they can still get the flu vaccine, but it should not be given during uh, if one has a moderate to severe illness. Um, and ideally, you want to be healthy well when you get your uh, flu vaccine because you really want your immune system to be functioning at its, um, at its best. Side effects of the flu vaccine. The main side effect of the flu vaccine is that it gives you a sore arm for a day or two. That's the main one. Some people can get an elevated temperature and by elevated temperature uh, would be something under 100.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but again, the most common side effect is really a sore arm, okay? Um, that's really the main one. So side effects are possible, but a sore arm is the most common. And it's usually sore for one to two days. Now with the nasal spray or the intranasal, that can actually produce mild symptoms of flu, okay? But with the flu shot, that does not give you the flu. Um, and the most common side effect with that is a sore arm for maybe a day or two. Major side effects of getting the flu vaccine can happen. Some people can have a severe uh, allergic reaction to it. Um, now, usually that is related to an egg allergy, but again, we do have formulations of the flu vaccine that are egg free. So just because they have an egg allergy does not mean that they wouldn't be able to get the flu vaccine. And then someone who had a history of Guillain-Barre um, would likely not be a good candidate for the flu vaccine. And we talked about that earlier. So preventing flu, this is very important. So this goes without saying, avoid contact with people who are sick. Um, sometimes that's not always so easy if you're a parent or a caregiver. So what can be done in that case is that if you're caring for someone, you're picking up after them, uh, wear a mask. When you are in close proximity to your loved one, use gloves. If you're picking up after them, you're picking up tissues and things like that. And then if you're sick, cover your sneezes and coughs, cough into your arm, sneeze or cough into your arm as opposed to your hand. And then stay home for 24 hours after the fever subsides. That's important because that helps to decrease your contagiousness. Clean and disinfect surfaces and objects in your home. You can use disinfectant wipes like Lysol or Clorox to clean off common surfaces, faucet handles, doorknobs, door handles, channel changers, phones, things like that. And then practice healthy habits, eating a well-balanced diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, getting regular exercise. And the recommendation from the American Heart Association is that adults should be getting 30 minutes of exercise five days a week and kids should be getting 60 minutes every day. Get adequate sleep. This is usually seven to eight hours of sleep a night if possible and avoid smoking. And this is important. Um, obviously avoiding smoking is helpful for our health in multiple ways. It decreases our risk of lung cancer, for example, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but also smokers are more likely to develop secondary bacterial infections. So avoiding smoking is very important. Complications. So moderate complications of influenza can include sinus infections, ear infections. And when you think about it, um, if there's nasal congestion with influenza, then one can get fluid in their ears and sinus cavities. And then that being a warm, moist environment, it can facilitate the growth of bacteria leading to a secondary bacterial infection. And then at that point, it might need antibiotics. 
Also, um, people with asthma can experience asthma attacks. Uh, people with chronic heart disease can experience uh, an increase in inflammation of their heart um, following infection with influenza. So when people have asthma, for example, their airways are already swollen and sensitive and flu can furthermore increase the inflammation and actually trigger asthma attacks and make their symptoms worse. And then serious complications can include pneumonia. So again, there's secretions that build up in the lungs. There's inflammation in the airways. Again, warm, moist environment, it can facilitate bacterial growth. So again, why it's important if one has a productive cough with influenza to use an over-the-counter what's called mucolytic or medication that will actually help break up that mucus, such as uh, guafenicin or mucinex over-the-counter um, and making sure to take it with a full glass of water. That helps to break up that mucus and make it easier to cough up so that it doesn't sit in the airways and lead to a complication such as pneumonia. These are some statistics for Michigan. According to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, this is for the week ending in March 16th, 2019. And I picked that because this is most current what's available um, 2019 to 2020 because we don't have 2020 to 2021 yet. And March would be toward the end of the flu season. So interesting to note that at that point, Michigan influenza activity was still widespread. Although after that, you see it taper off because that is getting toward the end of flu season. There were a total of 414 patient visits that were due to influenza-like illnesses reported out of 12,572 office visits. This accounted for 4.4% of outpatient visits, and that's above the national baseline of 2.2%. It was asked at our last training, why might it be above national baseline? Well, if you think about it, Michigan is a, a colder state, it's further north, and um, we have a, a longer winter season. And during the winter time or when temperatures are cold, more people are staying in and, and infections can spread more easily when people are in close crowded conditions. These are statistics for the nation. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Influenza Hospitalization Surveillance Project, for lab confirmed cases of the flu uh, running October 1st to April 30th, April, I'm um, sorry, October 1st, 2018 to April 30th, 2019, just since October 1st, there were 581 influenza related hospitalizations for the 2018 to 2019 season. And this included 87 kids 494 adults. So we're trying to avoid this by getting the word out about the flu shot and, and vaccinating as many people as we can because by that we can cut down on the number of cases of influenza and the number of hospitalizations, complications from influenza such as pneumonia. So really trying to have an impact on that. So there are common myths when it comes to the flu shot and influenza overall. One myth is that the flu shot can give you influenza or the flu. And I addressed this earlier, but no, that's not true. Maybe it was that a person was exposed a few days prior to getting their flu shot and they may have been incubating it at the time they got their flu shot. Or it could be that they contracted a different virus with similar symptoms but it, the flu shot does not give you influenza or the flu. Now the intranasal or the nasal spray um, does contain a weakened form and that can give you mild symptoms of the flu, but the flu shot is an inactivated form or a killed form of the virus and it does not give you the flu. The next myth, the flu shot can prevent stomach and intestinal viruses. No, Influenza or the flu is a respiratory virus. It can cause GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea in, in individuals, but that's more common in kids when it occurs. And, and truthfully, the influenza or flu is a respiratory virus. So the flu shot is protecting against influenza, which is a respiratory virus, not a intestinal virus. 
Another myth, number three, one can get the flu by going outside in cold weather without a coat on. That is false. You actually would need to come in contact with someone with the virus or contact with a surface that has viral particles on it. So just by going outside without a coat does not, um, cannot give you the flu. Myth number four, one does not need to get a flu shot every year. That is not true. The flu virus can change or mutate from year to year. And so one needs to get their flu shot every year. Myth number five, pregnant women should not get a flu shot. That is not true. We know that fever is common with influenza. And if a pregnant woman gets a fever there is an, during her pregnancy, there is an increased chance of the baby being born with birth defects. Also, having influenza or fever during pregnancy has also been associated with an increased risk of the child developing autism. So it is very important that pregnant women get their flu shot every year. And also individuals that will be caring for the baby for that matter. Okay, myth number six, one cannot get the flu if they had their flu shot. So that is not true. When one gets their flu shot, that means that they likely will not get the flu at all, or if they did, it would be a milder form of the flu. So one could still get the flu if they get their flu shot, but it's not that common. So again, getting the flu shot usually means you won't get the flu, or if you did, it'd be a much milder form of it. And then myth number seven, antibiotics need to be prescribed to treat influenza. That is not true. Antibiotics are effective for bacterial infections, but the flu is a viral infection. So that's why antivirals are used to treat the flu and antiviral treatment uh, is effective when started within 48 hours or two days of developing symptoms of influenza. All right, so it's important to look at and compare influenza versus cold versus COVID-19 versus allergies because they can produce similar symptoms. Now, with a cold, the symptoms are more gradual, whereas with flu, they come on more suddenly. With a cold, fever is less common. With flu, fever is more common. With a cold, the cough is less severe. With flu, the cough is more severe. With a cold, a stuffy nose is um, more common. With flu, a stuffy nose is less common. So those are some comparisons between influenza and cold. Now transitioning into COVID-19. With COVID-19, it spreads more easily than flu, causes more severe disease, and we do not have a vaccine for it yet. Whereas with influenza, we do. And then allergies. So all the rest, cold, COVID-19, influenza are caused by a virus. Allergies are not caused by a virus. With allergies, they usually are in response to a specific allergen, whatever the person is allergic to, often affiliated with a particular season. So pollen is usually, you know, summer to fall, and then um, you've got, uh, you know, late summer to fall is really like your, your hay fever. So you see that being more related to allergies, and allergies will continue as long as that allergen is present. With allergies, there is no fever, whereas with flu, there is often a fever. And with allergies, there's no aches and pains. With flu, there are often aches and pains. So those are some difference be differences between influenza and allergies. What questions do you have for me? Okay. Well, without further ado, I will pass it over to Sarah Lally, who is a member of the Center for Health Disparities Innovations 
and studies, and she is also an ICU nurse at Michigan Medicine. Go ahead, take it away, Sarah. Thank you so very much. And wonderful job, Dr. Hoffman, and thank, thank you, you for that lovely introduction as well. And I just wanna encourage everybody to, if just as we go along, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. Because mm -hmm. sometimes as we go, you know, we don't think of things right away. So at any point in time, if you have a question, just go ahead and feel free to put it there for us. And so without further ado, we will talk a little bit about healthy habits to strengthen your immune system. And so I'm really, um, first and foremost, going to turn it over to our expert in this domain, Dr. Alice Jo Rainville, and she is going to talk to us about um, different kinds of nutritions and things that we can do to keep our immune system healthy. Hi, everyone. So nice to be here and be part of Dr. Wu's team and to work with all of you. Um, so tonight we want to talk about uh, nutrition as one of the key components to strengthen your immune system. And everyone should be eating a balanced diet. Uh, lots of food variety is really important. You want to focus on nutrient rich foods and aim to get lots of fruits and vegetables daily, um, which will give you all your important vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. Okay, next slide, please. And um, I pulled this up, I searched um, for different immune supporting nutrients, and these are pretty much agreed on. There's um, research is ongoing regarding the immune system and nutrition, but here are some of the key components. Uh, protein, of course, is good, and it can come from both animal and plant-based sources. And so we've given you some foods here that are good to include in your diet. Zinc is important. Again, lots of sources, animal sources are the best for zinc, but uh, vegetarian diets also include zinc. Vitamin C is important for your immune system. And again, this is lots of fruits and vegetables that contain vitamin C. And beta carotene is that orange, yellow orange color. So it's found in sweet potatoes, um, carrots, even spinach and other uh, green vegetables like broccoli have the beta carotene, even though those are green, but the beta carotene's in there as an orange pigment. Uh, vitamin D is found in many foods, um, especially milk because it's added to milk. And then uh, vitamin D is in uh, lots of foods as well. So that's, again, the food variety is key getting lots of varieties of food, not eating the same thing every day. And then probiotics, um, which I'm not sure they're a nutrient, but we'll sneak these in at the end. And the probiotics uh, can be found in cultured dairy products, such as yogurt, and also in fermented foods, such as kimchi. So you can read the labels and see that they have the active cultures, and uh, those can also help support your immune system. So um, thanks for having me to um, cover some of the nutrients. And um, if you have any questions, please include them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. And so we will continue to talk about other healthy habits to strengthen your immune system. And so we always think of important things like exercise and sleep. So when it comes to exercise, we are talking 30 minutes, at least five days a week, which sounds like a lot, but you can sneak it in in a lot of different ways. And so maybe you go on a 10 minute walk around the neighborhood once or twice a day. Um, even if you're at the grocery store and you're walking and you know, you're pushing your heavy cart, you know, as long as we are moving for 30 minutes, five days a week. And ideally, we are doing a combination of exercise. So something cardiovascular, meaning, you know, you're breathing kind of heavy, getting your heart rate up, um, and also weight bearing. And so if you have access to weights, that's great. If you don't, even things like a gallon of milk or some, you know, larger size water bottles, there are a lot of things around your house that you can lift, um, you know, and get your muscles going 
especially because now not everybody feels safe going to a gym and not everybody has access to a gym. And so you can get creative in a lot of different ways that you can work out. And we also like to remember that walking is the best weight bearing exercise and that requires nothing but you, um, you're perfect as you are and just taking a nice walk and using your own muscles and bones as your, as your stability and resistance. And then sleep, we always talk about the importance of sleep. It's really hard for a lot of us to get it, but it's super important that we do our best to get an average of seven to eight hours of sleep per night. And that doesn't mean um, one night I'm going to get five hours and the next night I'm going to get 10 hours. You know, it's, it's not, it doesn't work that way. We're really looking for consistent sleep, um, seven to eight hours every night to really give your body and your brain that time to rest, heal, and then decompress just from your day. When we think about healthy habits to strengthen our immune system, we're always talking about stress management. We have good and bad stress in our life. And so keeping a balance between those two is really important. And when we're talking about stress management, sometimes it's nice to think about the four A's, um, avoid, alter, accept, and adapt. And so when we're thinking about avoid, you know, we're not thinking about avoiding stress altogether. It's really impossible to do that. I'm sure all of you can relate in our busy lives and families and the different dynamics of things that exist. And so really what we're talking about, you know, is learning to say no, you know, learning to honor ourselves and really just learning to maybe avoid some of those things that really stress us out. You know, if you have certain people, places, and things that really increase your stress level, do your best maybe to limit your time around those things. Um, again, because if you can't avoid it, maybe you can set some boundaries. When we're thinking about altering our stress, um, we're thinking about, again, setting those boundaries and then really about communication and just being able to talk about your feelings, telling people, you know what, I don't, I don't have the space for that right now, and just honoring your body and the way that you're feeling. When we're talking about acceptance, we are understanding that life happens and that we make mistakes just like other people make mistakes. And so it's kind of reframing your thinking, you know, instead of, instead of saying to yourself, oh, I'm so stupid, I made this bad mistake, you know, being kind to yourself and saying, you know what, I made a mistake, this is how I'm going to learn for it, learn from it, and this is how I'm going to do my best moving forward. And really um, acting as your own cheerleader instead of acting like you yourself are the problem you know, and really just learning to accept yourself where you are, no matter what. And then when it comes to adapting to stress, um, once again, you know, just understanding, just like this picture, you know, we all have all of these different things coming into our lives all the time that are unavoidable. And so really just learning to navigate this the way, the way that we can the best. Um, and sometimes, you know, creating a mantra and telling yourself, you know, I can do this, keep going, you know, it's going to be okay and not um, eliminating those bad feelings, but just working to increase the positive thoughts that we have. And we also can develop lots of other healthy habits to strengthen our immune system when it comes to stress management, things like meditation and prayer. Um, meditation and prayer both look a lot different for everybody, depending on who you are. You know, meditation comes in different forms. It doesn't have to be um, just being quiet and trying to eliminate your thoughts. There's guided meditation. There's, you know, being observant of your thoughts. There's mindful meditation, just being present in the moment, spending time outside, um, really just enjoying the, the feel of the air when there is sunshine, um, feeling the sunshine on your skin. Even when it's gray outside, you know, just finding the beauty in the surroundings around you. Music, um, whatever kind of music it is that you like, um, not everybody has the same taste in music, but understanding what makes you feel good and then just building in the time to surround yourself with more of those things. And then very lastly, deep breathing. Um, I know we've all probably heard a lot about this, 
but it's pretty incredible just taking 10 seconds and focusing on your breath, closing your eyes, settling into your seat, relaxing a little bit, putting your feet on the ground and just taking some really nice, slow, deep breaths in and out. It's a really great way to center ourselves and to ground ourselves and just kind of visualize um, being connected and letting go of some of that stress. I think that um, deep breathing is one of my personal favorites because it literally takes just a few seconds and it's really easy just to come back to your center and just release a lot of the energy that's making you feel stressed out. And so now we are gonna have a lot of fun in our breakout rooms. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen real quick. And then I believe we are all just gonna kind of magically pop into these rooms. Oh, Dr. Wu, are you gonna, hold on, I can't hear you. Maybe it's just me. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. It's a uh, unmuting kind of magic that I have to do. So um, I just want to remind people that um, we want you to kind of share um, like, you know, you will be in this breakout room, you will act like a very trusted messenger, like, you know, what Jenny and um, Alice, Joe, and Sarah um, teach you just about, you know, how these important uh, information about food. So I hope you could um, start kind of use, utilizing this information in the breakout room. And so we will have about 15 minutes in, um, in the smaller groups and then come back. And I really want to hear from each one of the organization. You could you know, have someone representing the organization and talked about how you're going to work with our team as a, you know, educational promotions and also the mobile clinics, you know, in the Initiative. And I feel so awful. You have to let me um, introduce my favorite. Sorry, that's not the right word. <laughs> Other people are going to kill me. Um, so this is a very important person in our team, Dr. Miriam Cobra Stevens, and she is our program manager for Reach and also for this one. So um, we. Um, I, I just, you know, uh, every time that I feel like, you know, I hit a rock or, you know, hit a block, I always go to her, like, you know, um, you probably do not know this. And uh, some of you, I hope that uh, many, I know you attended. So in the back in uh, June, we uh, hosted a uh, virtual town hall meeting. And at that time we have Congresswoman Dingo, you know, all the way to the state legislator. And it was like over a hundred people kind of virtual town hall. And who did it? It's Miriam and Jessica. So, you know, um, again, doctor, please uh, let's give a, you know, thumbs up for uh, Dr. Cobra Stevens. And um, okay, so Miriam, do you have a few words? You are muted. A mute magic mutton. <laughs> yep. Do the magic and get everybody into the room. See okay. you later. Okay, Bye. 15 minutes. Bye. Have fun. <laughs>
Well, I see all familiar faces here. So I, I think that we are waiting for a merge of the, ah, here we go. All right, perfect. So um, what I am going to do as we all kind of gather back here is I am going to go ahead and share my screen and let our fearless director, Dr. Wu, kind of help us wrap up and hear from you guys um, about our plans. And here we go. Thank you, Sarah. Did you, we had a wonderful discussion and fun scenarios. And um, so what about you? What's, what's your breakout room look like? Yeah, we had a, we had a really great time. Um, it was a lot of fun, just like we were hoping and lots of great questions and many good ideas um, about how people are going to help dispel kind of some of these myths about the flu vaccine. That's great. That's great. So um, I'm really excited about this part because, you know, I would love to hear about um, how you think that um, we could work together as partners to strengthen this important initiative, uh, the flu initiative in your community. So last week or Saturday, we have um, a, a similar training. And so we have people from Filipino and um, I'm going to miss it. You know, someone has to rescue me. So I'm kind of drawing blank. We, we basically have four groups and um, uh, different ethnic uh, Asian groups. Um, so today we have, I, I believe we have um, again that uh, ben Bangladesh represented, Bengali group represented it. Hi, for, for Hana. And then we have um, Debbie from uh, Korean community, uh, James from Vietnamese community. And then Huang Huan is from uh, Huang Huan and Lisa is, are from China and, and Gui Su is from Chinese um, communities. And, um, and even though I think um, they're one from East um, in the Metro Detroit area in Madison Heights and uh, Grace Zhu is from uh, West Michigan working with West WMAA. And we have Minnie who is an ED from WMAA. And we have Core from Mong Group. Hi, Core. you know, even though we cannot hear you, you know, very, um, very eager to work in the Hmong community. And we have Tika and uh, Krishna mm -hmm. representing the Pali community. And um, this is so exciting, you know, and Naomi and Ta from last um, week, uh, last Saturday from uh, Burmese uh, community in Burma Center, um, Battle Creek, Springfield. And I know I'm missing one. And Sarah, can you introduce uh, someone um, in your group? Because um, the names I'm <laughs> so uh, Sarah or um, is that Jamal? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And and thank you for that. We are so grateful to have Jamal with us um, because he is our trusted messenger for the Arabic community, and we searched high and low for someone that would join us um, to represent this group that we know we can reach out to and do some good work in the community. And so thank you so much for joining us for this. We're super grateful that you were here. You're welcome. Yes, and as you can see that, you know, I think um, this is like when you, if I um, say, you know, represent us in uh, back to CDC, I think there will be super, super um, excited. Like, you know, we, you know, even in Michigan, I always say that people don't think about Asian, you know, um, that actually are in Michigan. They think about New York City, they think about West Coast. But I think, you know, if we work together, you know, um, and united and, and we could really um, kind of, I'm sorry, and, and um, Arab, you know, I, I think we are working you know, we are including everybody because this is, a, again, very um, significant work. We need everybody's uh, working as a collaborator, as partners. So I would like to um, invite our um, partners to share with us uh, some of your kind of uh, initial thoughts about uh, working in this, uh, um, in this project with us. So, um, I don't know if uh, someone would kind of volunteer, <laughs> uh, but you know, I will welcome volunteer if you know after ten seconds or five seconds, I will start kind of um, 
as a faculty, I'm very used to that. I'm starting <laughs> just kind of, you know, um, point, pointing people or, you know, asking people. So uh, anybody want to kind of uh, uh, share with us what your in initial thought about this um, working with our teams in this, in this project? Well, my name is Jamal, um, uh, representing uh, JNE Community uh, Relief in Hamtramck. Uh, and uh, Sarah reached out to us, and I believe on the 6th, they're going to come out and uh, do the flu shots in our center. So I'll be helping out over there in any kind of way they need translation to the Arabic community. Um, we have a lot of, Hamtramck is a melting pot. So we have the Polish, we have the uh, Bosnians, uh, Gen, uh, Bengalis, Yemenis, and um, so we have a good, a good uh, ethnic background in Hamtramck. So hopefully we'll have a good turnout. And uh, I believe we've been sharing, um, you know, the uh, posters for that day. Thank you, Jamal. This is very you're welcome. Very nice. And like uh, um, Jamal say, Jenny has doing this uh, amazing job uh, for for um, secure the uh, food and um, and we work with them um, to with disseminate them. the care packages in, in the month of May. And so um, truly JP is our very strong partner and uh, starting from working with our nutrition domains, but then now in, uh, expanding to the arena. So it's very, very nice to, uh, we welcome your, your partnership. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Likewise, thank you. Anybody want to? Anybody want to? So I have one thing and the last one. Uh, Dr. Suyen, I think uh, I got a lot of flyers, uh, PDF files right now for nutrition things. But what about the flu vaccine uh, flyer? Should uh, send us some. Uh, I think that will help us to give the information to the uh, uh, in the community. And also the nutrition one uh, in Nepali, Burmese, Vietnamese, Chinese. I think that will help us to uh, give it to the different stores and also uh, send it to the community. Yes, that's excellent, excellent yes. question, uh, Krishna. Excellent. We do okay. have uh, three brochures right now that um, we develop in English and uh, we have translated into, I think, five or six. And unfortunately, it's through the work I shouldn't say that, unfortunately. It's actually very fortunately that we have Europe students that um, they're doing the translation. Now we have Chinese version in um, um, the Ember and Jason, they took it and now it has a, a, a symbol of I as well as traditional characters. We have Vietnamese, you know, with the James help. We have Korean with um, Debbie's translation and Bengali, which we are absolutely thrilled because uh, one of our navigator actually okay that translations in the first run. So um, I must miss, you know, I, oh, there's Tamil and there's Urdu. Uh, so, so we are still in the process of uh, getting it to uh, Burmese, um, which uh, we are going to work with the uh, Burma Center. And also, uh, we, we probably need your help, uh, Krishna, because we don't have someone uh, right now here in, in Metro Detroit side with the Nepali kind of language. So yes, once you know we have them you know, translated into these additional, um, all the Asian language, then we're ready to partner uh, with uh, w WMAA Mini. So what we're looking for from each organization is, is that you will be sending us a some sort of uh, plan, very easy kind of, um, plan like you know how you're going to use those three brochures and trend, um, then um, maybe uh, print it out in a uh, English um, 
or the Asian language versions. And um, so, so basically that we need to um, hear from you how you're going to use those materials that we develop in your respective communities and what kind of resources we cannot, you know, we, we, we cannot possibly to help you make copies because if you need a physical copies, we are happy to um, provide the funding so you could um, duplicate it into the uh, physical copies for, for, for the community. So we, we just need to um, have you to come up with uh, some sort of uh, proposal or plan and let us know how you're going to take the education material to, uh, for the uh, promotion campaign. So um, that's a, some sort of uh, uh, next step that Sarah Miriam, Miriam is uh, going to contact uh, many um, because you are previously connected, and we're still hoping to uh, get the public county public health department, like King County public health department, to work with your um, refuge work with WMAA okay. and eventually uh, setting up a um, clinic, flu clinic. Um, at a refugee education center or the place where the Vietnamese temple or some some place you think that would benefit the community. So um, anybody else maybe? Kent County Health Department. Uh, maybe someone from uh, Burma Center. Uh, Naomi? Yep, thank you, Dr. Wu. Um, yeah, so I'm excited um, to have this partnership, um, not only because all of you are so educated um, in this um, material piece. Um, a lot of our Burmese community are uh, unaware of, and I'm not sure if a lot of them uh, have actually gone and, you know, gotten their flu shots or not, because I believe some people um, like the myths that we're seeing, a lot of people are believing those. And so like that's causing some people to not get their flu shot. So I think we like having this partnership will really bring us um, more awareness and uh, knowledge. And also like, I think having you guys as our partners, like we'll be able to use, um, like utilize resources and then we'll provide our resources to you guys as well. Um, and I think just like overall, like the connections that we can have amongst uh, fellow Asians in our community in Michigan um, is something that we're really wanting to seek out. Um, but yes. Great. Thank you, Naomi. So I think, you know, um, <clears throat> Ta earlier email about that, how do we make this uh, translation happen? So um, mm -hmm. If that, um, and Ta said she's going to, um, after you finish tonight trainings that you two were going to kind of uh, discuss and um, Sarah will be follow up with you and mm -hmm. see to take it um, to the next step. Mm -hmm. um, first about the translation of the materials and then um, then set up the clinic in your community. And I think a lot of times that it's about the miscommunications or misinformation that mm -hmm. um, people may think the flu vaccine is doing the way that it's not actually correct information out there. So, mm -hmm. you know, we really want um, to dispel those myths and misconceptions, which are through um, the trusted messenger like you and Ta and maybe other community leaders. And another thing is that um, if you want to pull up a, a, a kind of similar, cause Ta talked about, you know, having a, a session with the, uh, your community mm -hmm. and to have coming out to join the Zoom session. And maybe it's a shorter version. I think um, this one is very comprehensive because we want to empower you, get you all the information. But for yeah. the community uh, Zoom session, we could design it into a shorter kind of a span, maybe 10, 15. I mean, 10 is too short, maybe 20 minutes mm -hmm. uh, with some Q&A. So mm -hmm. that might be something that uh, we could also look into. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Good. And so uh, why don't we hear from ACA, Association of Chinese American? Hi. Uh, I'm Huan Huan. Nice to meet you guys. I'm program coordinator from Association of Chinese American. 
you know, we have lots of social platforms such as WeChat, Line, Facebook, Twitter. So we will share uh, educational documents through these social platforms. And we also, uh, uh, we will also update this information on the, our SA official website. Uh, at the same time, we will also share, sh share the flyers for the flu clinic to the senior apartment nearby, uh, such as Auckland uh, Park Towers apartment, Medicine Height Coop apartment, and others. Yeah. So, uh, well, Huang Huang, we, we are currently uh, talking to Joyce, uh, your ED, that we're thinking that the food clinic that probably will be more central um, at AC at the Medicine High Center, the community center. Yeah, uh, our, uh, our flu short activity will, open, uh, will happen in November 14 at the CCC, yeah. Yes, yes. Good. So you said you will be open when? When is are you open again? It's November fourteenth. Uh, November fourteenth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um. So um. I think we have an. Thank you so much. You know, hearing about this um, social media outlet that um Chinese community currently is utilizing, and that's really really uh powerful. Uh, for Hannah, for Hannah, you're here. Yes, share with us you with your uh group. Okay, so my name is Farhana. I will be represent. I will be working for uh, the Bangladeshi community in Hamtramck. And uh, we have a pretty um, large community and I'm happy to, I'm really excited to work with you all. And uh, thanks uh, Dr. Wu for uh, involving me in this program. And uh, um, I'm mostly excited because, you know, uh, language barrier is a, is a very big challenge in our, uh, in Bangladeshi community. So um, the flyers, uh, if we get the uh, flyers in, written in Bangla, and if we can uh, communicate with our uh, community, uh, you know, the, the, um, the training materials that um, I have learned from the, from the uh, slides uh, today, those will be very helpful. I can uh, um, spread this message for our community members in Bangla, and I think that will be very helpful. And um, we have some plan in mind, uh, you know, we have a, um, a a uh, spot that we can use for this full clinic. And uh, also I uh, have some uh, resources and uh, uh, I plan to work with um, the uh, medical doctor's offices uh, to reach um, our community members and also from grocery stores, um, pharmacies, we plan to uh, distribute flyers to, to reach out uh, uh, Bangladeshi community members for this clinic. Exciting. Thank you, Fahana. It's so nice um, that, uh, thank you for joining this uh, uh, important initiative. And um, we look forward, um, believe it or not, that Sarah and I, with our previous, not previous, just kind of, uh, um, we just completed a, a, a um, annual projects in lead poisoning health. And we work with uh, uh, Dr. Hussein's um, office. <laughs> so, and we just got to know you now. And so it's like, whoa, it's a small world. <laughs> so yes, very exciting. Um, so we have someone that Core is uh, uh, in the group and she has been using the chat box. And so Core, we are very um, happy to have you working with us um, and um, in upcoming um, this uh, uh, initiative said, um, so CORE is representing a uh, Hmong community. So uh, basically CORE's questions or um, she in the chat box is like, you know, um, she, she feel like she needs a lot of uh, uh, information and supplies for the food clinic. So just kind of clarify that what we are looking out for you is that taking the information we share with you to your community said um, starting to disseminate these information to encourage, motivate community residents to ready to take action. Uh, 
And for the flu clinics that we don't ask you to set it up or anything, because we have two organizations that uh, we will be um, using their help. So basically is that we will work with you on the locations and you will help us to recruit people. And but the organization agencies that we are using will provide all the logistics of uh, getting people, um, so to have people getting flu shots. And so um, don't worry about the logistic of flu clinics, you know, staffing flu clinics. That's not what we ask of you, but rather we ask um, you, your partnership to identify a location venue and help us to promote and bring people in to get um, the flu vaccination. And I hope that I clarify that for everyone, including CORE. So we're about, I think we're about any other comments and um, uh, final kind of uh, uh, questions and before we adjourn today. Yes, post test. Yes, um, go to the chat box. There's a link. <laughs> Just click that link and then start filling out those very um, easy answer questions and which will help us out because we want to know what you learn. And again, you know, um, we hope everybody do well, but um, if, if somehow that you miss one or two questions, that's fine. We just need to hear from you. So post task, you know, we, if you don't fill it out, you will receive another email. So why don't you just kind of figure out how to get over it with, and yes, questions, comments, and thoughts, anything, input, we love to hear. So I, I have a question. I, um, um, I mean, uh, I don't have a date yet uh, uh, for the, Clinic. I mean, who will confirm uh, the date or? Um... So Sarah will be uh, um, kind of uh, uh, going after today. So uh, we need to work with you because uh, there are some certain days that we're working around it. Mm -hmm. And we are also working with um, Wayne County Public Health Department uh, closely. And because they also very eager to um, provide those clinic uh, in the underserved um, Metro Detroit area, which is under um, the Wayne County. So uh, Sarah will be, um, emailing you, corresponding with you, and working those details in logistics. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anything that that I could Question? answer, questions, comments? Yes. Okay, I, uh, my name is Elena. I work with Philippine Nurses Association of Michigan. I'm pretty sure Dr. will know about our organization. Yes, Elena, hi. 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 Okay. Uh, if our president Riglita decided that we can come up with, maybe we'll do it at PCCM. How many how many people can we give a, a flu shot? Is there a, a certain number? Yes, and um, yes, and that's a detail that um, I think Sarah. Um, what work with you because uh, it depends on the day. You know, if you're thinking about the Saturday weekend day, weekend versus weekday, and mm -hmm. so um, we also wanted to see the agencies that we contract with are able to have that capacity. So, um, but again, that we don't want you know to have a uh, event with 20, 30 people. And um, so, so um, basically that that's a detail. I think, you know, um, yes, there's a range that we want to keep it at, you know, going not too far beyond the capacity, but also not too small. I mean, okay. small number, yes. And sure. this is a free flu shot, right? Uh, yes, so we, we would be providing that, um, everybody's that again that if there's like first 50 you know if we have a capacity of 50 then you know we will make sure those 50 uh will receive um the flu shots no charge yes okay okay thank you okay anything else no <laughs>
Okay, so we look forward to work with you and thank you again for coming out to join us uh, tonight. And I hope that you find this um, uh, training information you receive helpful. And again, that um, we won't be a stranger, we will um, be um, contacting you and working for the next steps. Thank you, have a nice evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.